At this point, I'm going to ask Mr. Peterson. I think he needs to be out of here by 3 o'clock. I think, I think we're still going to get it, but we're going to move him up before the reports to discuss the OEC draft. Okay. So, Cindy? Yes, I just would like to introduce uh, Greg Peterson. He's a partner with the firm of Weaver. And uh, they have completed our annual audit for ODC. And you have a draft that's been placed in front of you. It was also sent out in the packet last week. And so he's going to do a pretty high-level review of the audit. If you have any specific questions, he and I would be glad to answer those for you. Okay? Great. All right. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Cindy. So I think everyone should have a copy in front of them. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, uh, yeah. As Wendy, as Cindy mentioned, yeah, I'll go over this pretty high level. But I knew, I know we have some new members on the board. So if there's anything you want me to slow down and go into more detail, just let me know. Okay. So we'll start on page three of this draft report. So the whole point of an audit is for the auditors to render an opinion on the financial statements. So we have rendered, an, excuse me, an unmodified opinion. So that is the highest level of assurance that you can receive in an audit. Uh, so what we're saying is these financial statements are materially correct. Um, so we don't have any, uh, any concerns about the financial statements and the numbers presented themselves that they would mislead any, any users of these financial statements. So that's page three through five. We'll go to page seven. So page seven of the report is management's discussion and analysis. So this is a section prepared by management. It's basically like the reader's digest of what happened during the year. So this gives you comparative information, um, tells you some of the financial highlights during the year, uh, how we did to budget, um, just gives a good overview of all the activity during the year. So that's the MDNA section. Next, we'll start looking at actually some of the numbers. And for that, let's turn to page 17. So page 17 is the balance sheet of the governmental funds. So the general fund is the only, oper is the only fund within uh, the ODC. And we can see here that we have total assets of $61.3 million. Uh, of that amount, 59.5 is cash and investments. We have total liabilities of 5.8 million, with contracts payable being the largest portion of $3 million. And what makes up that contract payable, so that's uh, the UTPB uh, contract of about 1.5 million that's payable. Uh, we got Glazers at about 226,000 payable. Uh, we have OC is about close to a million bucks. Mm -hmm. And then we have the business challenge that's about 356,000. So combine all that, that's that's what's sitting there in that contract's payable. So that's for awards that have been earned. We just haven't made the cash payment to those folks yet. You'll recall that a lot of those have been made like October, November, December after year end, but they were actually earned as of 930. So in the audit, we have to accrue those back into that period. Okay. okay. So it's just a cash time <clears throat> uh, The next section is the fund balance section. Uh, within fund balance, you can see that we have multiple categories of fund balance uh, classified here. Uh, we have a non-spendable balance of $14,000. That's just equivalent to the amounts prepaid in our assets. Uh, next, we have what's what we call committed. So these are committed funds for business incentives, training grants, and other. Uh, and we actually have a schedule in the back that will break out this $12.5 million that we'll cover in a second. Uh, next, we have an assigned balance of $14.1 million. And what makes up this assigned balance is about $9.1 million of TxDOT and $4.9 million of the housing initiative. So that's what's sitting in assigned. And then next, we have unassigned fund balance of $28.7 million. So now when we talk about these different categories, Committed is what's done by the board. The board is responsible for committing fund balance for these projects. When we talk about assign, that's done by management. Management can assign certain uh, fund balance to, to future projects like TxDOT and for the housing this initiative. And when we talk about unassigned, that's just available for next year's operations. 
And uh, obviously, next year's operation, they're going to be paying for these incentive programs as they become due. Uh, but go ahead, Cindy, we're going to... Um, the assigned does go to the board here. The reason it's not considered committed is because there's not a third-party contract actually in place. We, we did a, a uh, agreement with TxDOT to provide that money as it's needed so it's not an actual contract for the total amount to pay out. It's as is needed. Certain amounts for each one of those. And I have a schedule that I'll go over with you all when I give my monthly report. Okay. All right. So we'll turn the page to page 18. And what we're looking at here, so this is the general fund income statement. So the general fund had total revenues of $11.9 million, uh, which is a, oh, well, it was about 20% decrease from prior year, I think is what we calculated earlier. So we're looking at 20% uh, decrease in revenues year over year, and it's really related to one item, that's your sales tax uh, revenue line item. Um, so sales tax decrease, so that was the, the main cause for the decrease in revenues. Uh, investment income also decreased over prior years, just as we all know, returns have dropped on investments. So uh, we, had a, we had less investment income from prior year. Looking at total expenditures of $8.9 million, uh, again, it was a decrease from prior year, but uh, you know expenses are basically uh, based on when these contracts and these incentives are earned. So that's the biggest function of what drives your expenditures during the year. Um, so we had total expenditures of $8.9 million. Next, we'll get into the notes of the financial statement. So the notes start on page 19. What the notes section does is just gives a little bit more context to these uh, balances presented in these financial statements. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to point your attention to some of these, uh, some of these note disclosures. Uh, just because I think they're, they're valuable and useful information. So let's turn to page 24. So earlier I mentioned on the balance sheet that you had $61 million of total assets and the largest piece was cash and investments of $59 million. So on page 24, uh, you have a schedule there that uh, shows the investments that you're, that you're currently holding. Um, and that total value is $59.5 million. So ODC has invested in certain investment pools, text pool, logic. Um, they're also invested in CDs, municipal securities, and some money market funds. Now, what drives the types of investments that ODC can invest in is the Public Funds Investment Act, which is um, something that is a, a governmental requirement uh, for governments to follow the Public Funds Investment Act. And, and also the, the ODC also follows the city's investment policy. So the main thing here is you know, we want to invest in securities that uh, give us security for like, you know, we're not overly risky, uh, that we have liquidity to, to pay these contracts as they come due. Uh, so that is why, why we're invested or why the ODC is invested in where they are. And this is pretty typical of what we see for most governmental entities. All right, next we'll turn to page 28. So page 28 is your schedule of um, budget to actual comparison. So when we look at total revenues, we can see that um, we missed the budgeted revenue number by about $300,000. Again, the biggest piece of that was due to the decrease in, uh, in sales tax. Uh, so the sales tax caused caused about a seven hundred thousand dollar increase in total total sell, or total revenue, um, which was just due to the the difference between what was earned prior year versus current year. Uh, for expenditures, we had a positive variance of forty six million dollars. Uh, when the budget is adopted by the board, um, the the board adopts a very conservative budget takes into consideration uh, basically all the amounts that would come due and payable during a year for all the awards. Uh, so that's why you see such a big fluctuation um, budget to actual comparison uh, for your expenditures. Uh, 
Well, and it does include an amount for future, for any incentives the board might want to adopt during the year. So it's got a, it, you, you're almost budgeting your total remaining fund balance into business incentives after you've taken care of all your other operations. We tend to try to leave about 10 million in there just for timing differences, accruals, different things like that. But when we're doing our budget, the biggest line item is always going to be the business incentives. And it's a big line item because we've accumulated uh, a lot of funds. So if there's a big project that comes due during the year, that budget is sitting there for that type of award if there's something that comes about. So. <clears throat> Okay, next we'll turn to page 37. So what we're looking at on page 37, so this is a schedule of uh, business incentives and other grants earned. And for fiscal year 20, there was a total of $6.2 million that, were, that was earned during the year. That number agrees back to the income statement on page 18. 18. The $6.2 million that we show as incentive expense on page 18 is the same 6.2 number we're presenting here. Uh, this what this does is this breaks it down to who actually earned the incentives. So we're just getting a little bit more detail about where the where the expense comes from. And the pages before will show you from the inception of ODC, what all awards have been have gone out, and there's been a few that's been returned, and you those will be noted by brackets, meaning that money came back in. So cumulative to date, we're at 58 as through 93020, 58.6 million almost. All right, and then on page 38. What we do is we have a supplemental schedule here for amounts committed. So earlier when I was talking about the balance sheet, we have fund balance that's in various categories. We we're saying non-spendable, restricted, committed, assigned, and unassigned. What we've done here is we've broken out your committed fund balance um, by you know, the business uh, incentive grant that has been awarded. And this is basically money just, just committed for the payment uh, of those contracts as they become due. All right. And then on page 41, uh, this is just a second opinion that or report that we issue with the financial statements. So when we conduct our audit, we conduct it under governmental auditing standards. Um, so this letter is just saying that we've evaluated internal controls of ODC. Uh, we do not we did not find any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies related to the internal controls. Uh, we also evaluated for compliance. We did not find any compliance issues. Either. And then you'll have included in your draft, I think you have a second letter. So under governmental auditing standards, we're also required to make certain communications uh, to governance. Um, and the short of it is, is basically that we did not experience any difficulties during the, during the audit. Uh, Sending them, they did not go out shopping for opinions. They didn't get second opinions from other auditors. Uh, there was no uh, transaction that we saw that there wasn't adequate accounting guidance to support. Um, basically, and there were no uh, unadjusted or uncorrected misstatements. Uh, basically, it was a good, clean audit. All right, well, that kind of wraps everything up I wanted to discuss. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions? Good. Good job. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, we'll move to item six, our contract reports. Uh, Wesley. Good afternoon, uh, board, Mr. Chair, and uh, welcome to. Uh, Chris, Larry, and Jeff, I uh, look forward to working with you, and hopefully you've had a chance to look over the reports. Uh, we send these out every month, and uh, it's a great reading. <laughs> so uh, uh, just hit the high points of a few of these projects. We've been talking about a few, a few of these for quite some time. A few of these are actually moving very, very close to 
to get into get to have some very positive news, I think. Uh, but uh, a couple of these I did want to hit the highlights that uh, we've mentioned before. Saber Chemical is a company that's actually purchased a facility in Odessa and then pretty much had to just put it on pause and see what the bank wanted to do and see what the company wanted to do and their, share, their shareholders, etc. Uh, I have had a couple of conversations with them recently, and they're close to being able to maybe get that going uh, again. So we, we would really be excited about that. It's the old Flint Hills facility out on uh, South Grandview out there. Uh, so that would be great to have some of that facility back in back in the uh, back in the mix for some businesses. And uh, a couple of these are reports on incentive packages that y'all, uh, the previous board. Uh, approved, the city council has approved those, and then COVID uh, came. So we've, we have had reports back from them that they probably are going to ask this board, and I don't know how we're going to do this, Natasha and I uh, are going to talk about that uh, as far as uh, termination of their agreement. There's not been any funds expended uh, because we always do a perform and then pay arrangement. So uh, they didn't even get through their first year, and they realized they're not going to be able to fulfill the obligations of the contract. So we're going to be able to stop those uh, and then hopefully bring those back later for uh, a refresh and hopefully a new agreement, uh, which, which keeps everybody on the positive and the plus because we don't have to go back every year and hope they've met compliance or they have to catch up and we've, we've got these issues. So I think it's a positive that they're, uh, they're forward thinking and they're being proactive and trying to make some contacts and, and moving those to a different uh, a level so we can bring those back at a later date and we'll be able to take those incentives off the books, off the audit that you just, uh, you just saw there. So uh, project uh, 2018-05 X uh, Energy, we've talked about that for uh, many, many years and, and it's a government type of uh, a program. It's a nuclear related facility. Uh, really don't have much update there but I did want to let you know that we have visited with a few of the principals in that and they are still uh, kind of the same conversations we've had before. They still would like for this to happen, but there's a lot of things that have to go in place on that. Um, the 2020-02 uh, is a project we've been working on now for about a year, and that's one of the big ones that we're talking about, hopefully uh, in more detail coming up. It is a uh, natural gas to gasoline manufacturing process that we're excited about the possibilities. They have not made a site location decision uh, but they are beginning the, the discussions on some different uh, incentives that might uh, make their decisions moving forward. So you might have seen some publicity around the company that's uh, applied for a 313 uh, with the school district. Uh, this company has also filed a uh, air quality permit request permit application with TCEQ, so there has been some publicity. But all of those factors do not mean they've made a side decision. Uh, so that's coming up hopefully soon with the help of some incentives. Obviously, that's what we do and that's what we want to hope for. So I did want to let you know that uh, meetings are starting to uh, refresh. Uh, some some uh, groups that we go to uh, actually have wait lists to be a part of and get to go to their meetings that we are members of. So those have all canceled uh, their face-to-face -face meetings in the last year. Those are actually starting to come back on. Those are where we get to go to uh, visit with site location consultants. Uh, and a lot of times they'll have companies there as well. It's a great opportunity to share our message. That is actually where the very large project we're working on actually came through one of those meetings and through a site location consultant that we had a relationship with. So uh, all of that to say that I think 2021 is going to be a really, really good year for economic development for Odessa. And uh, we're really, really busy. I'm excited to have uh, a, a full board and an expanded board. Uh, so I uh, look forward to working with everyone on here and uh, be happy to answer any questions about anything in the report or anything that you might have heard that we're working on or we might be needing to work on. So I appreciate the opportunity to do this uh, for my hometown where I grew up and it's an honor and a pleasure to serve. Any questions? I hope it stays that way. Appreciate that. <laughs> okay, next on is CBA advertising. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome to the new board members. We're glad you're here. Hope to get to know each one of you better as we go forward and do good things for Odessa. You've got a full copy of my report in your uh, uh, packet. 
So I'll just hit some of the highlights and then answer any questions that you might want to have. Uh, Opportunity Odessa, our podcast. We have got four new podcasts, uh, one featuring the new mayor, Mr. Hoban, or Mayor Hoban, I should say, County Judge Debbie Hayes, ECISD uh, Superintendent Scott Murray, and the UTP Athletic Director. Those will be actually starting next week. We have one more we need to edit, and then we'll actually start all of those on the air. Our television schedule is kind of wound down for the year, or for the, for the fiscal, fiscal year for ODC. Uh, at this point, we are going to be on some major golf tournaments going forward and other sporting events, uh, but the spots that we're now currently running are centered around business retention and expansion and the current one that we're running has uh, Mr. Nick Fowler featured in it. Uh, outdoor advertising and newspaper advertising, I'll cover both those at the same time. For the month of February, we had our the Permian Fuels America messaging, uh, both in newspaper and also on outdoor. And as of March 1, that has been changed back to the business retention and expansion that we had prior to that as well. Trade publications, we do have a half-page ad that has been produced and will come out in the March-April issue of Te uh, Expansion Solutions magazine. So uh, there's a sample of that ad in, your, in the back of your booklet. You can take a look at that. Social media was not bad this past, uh, this past month in, in the website. Website total session, sessions were up, but page views were down about 25%. Conversely, Social media was down slightly, but we think both of those were caused by the, the uh, snowstorm that we had, the uh, decrease in power in some of the areas, and also Wi-Fi access that was down. We anticipate those will come back up this next month, and so we'll have more information on that for you at that point. That's my report, and I'd love to answer any questions that you might have. Any, any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank Welcome you. aboard, and uh, thank you. Uh, next on our agenda is the Black Chamber of Commerce. She's really nervous, so I'm going to stand up here with her. Because <laughs> I was so caught off guard. Um, Chris uh, apologizes for not being able to be here. Um, he has some personal things that he needed to take care of. But um, I have my phone for my notes. But good afternoon, Mr. Chair and the board. Um, Chris, the, I'm Gloria Wright with the Black Chamber. And um, in the notes of what Chris has said to me, we have used $1,275 of the funds for administrative assistance uh, salary. This was to um, promote the upcoming events that um, we have, uh, on, have already have on the schedule. As much as today we're doing uh, and hosting a meet and greet today from 6, 6 to 8 p.m. tonight. Um, He's going to get with Wesley um, to learn how or to get the, the invoices into the system so that uh, he will have a, report, a reporting uh, system for this next month. And that is all that he has shared with me at this time. And I apologize for being not so prepared. He caught, kind of caught me off guard uh, yeah. a little bit. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions for me at this time? What's the meeting really good we are the the point of tonight. The intent tonight uh, of for tonight's meet and greet is to uh, give the public an opportunity to ask questions from our new president of the Black Chamber of Commerce and to possibly increase the uh, enrollment. Who is Chris Walker? Yes. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not going to stand up here with Paul. He's good. Okay, now for the Hispanic Chamber. Unless you want me to. Yeah, you can. No, you're okay. Thank you, though. Uh, thank you, the board. Um, I'm excited to be here in person for the first time. Um, I'll just go over the review. I have a little small 
report here and just kind of talk about what we're planning on doing now and in the future. Um, one of the things that the Ch Hispanic Chamber, um, I believe the Hispanic Chamber needed to do was start to refocus on the small businesses here in the area. Um, as of right now, we're actively communicating with three businesses that are uh, planning on expanding here in the future. They're very small businesses. They're um, actually all three of them are single entities. Um, there's a, uh, hoin, a crane hoisting uh, company in manufacturing that is ex splitting from an existing company. Um, they are they have five employees they're ready to hire um, with their their own capital investment that's happening there. Um, I will probably get with Wesley at some point and see if this is something that the ODC can um, entertain. Um, we have another smaller ice manufacturing company that is providing ice to different uh, oil field yards out in the area. Um, we're kind of working with them to really build up their business fundamentals, making sure they understand how to budget, how QuickBooks works, um, understanding just those basic fundamentals as they start growing so that we can start getting them to a place where hopefully they will be able to start hiring maybe drivers at some point. Um, and then probably the biggest project we have right now is a long haul trucking company. Um, they are, this was actually not a report, this happened a couple days ago. We have a, a, a gentleman that came from Honduras here that is a, a single contractor, he has one truck right now. Um, he's actually, we're actually going to help him get his uh, paperwork together so maybe he can entertain an um, SBA loan. Um, he is planning on expanding to uh, several more trucks um, in the area. He's already showing plenty of promise over the past few months. A very profitable business, so now he's thinking about trying to what that expansion would look like. I mean, again, I think me and Wesley are going to be working together on, on trying to figure out how to make that work for them. Um, uh, on other ongoing projects, we have the uh, Paycheck Protection Program. We've done a couple of webinars for that. We're actually watching very closely right now. There was a, um, I don't know if people are aware of this, there was a congressional bill that just passed the House where they're moving the deadline to May 31st. Um, we're, we're thinking that's probably going to end up passing the Senate as well, so we're going to keep doing this, the Paycheck Protection Program and reach as many people as we can. Um, I believe over the past webinars that we have done, we've had over 100 people attend um, one or more of the, uh, the webinars that we've done for the PPP. Um, we're working on getting that together and see which of them have actually successfully um, done that and how much revenue is actually being brought into the city. Um, Business development workshops, we've been working with the Small Business Development Center. Um, we've done helped with outreach for two of their uh, two of their plans. There was a how to write a business plan. We had 59 total attendees, I believe. Um, and I don't have the numbers for the people fund one, um, but I know that we're actively using the ODC funds to help with the Small Business Development Center in the webinar, um, with their webinars. And hopefully in the future, now that we're starting to see the light at the end of the pandemic tunnel, that maybe we can start doing some in-person events um, soon. Um, and then I've got my visits here, uh, pretty simple to go through there. And another conversation that's not on here was, I did speak to Christopher Walker today um, and talk to him about is there a way for us to partner with the Black uh, Chamber of Commerce and figure out what we can do together to kind of help with the economic development side on this. Um, so thank you guys. If you guys have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. I just have one comment. Um, I'm happy to hear that you, re you made three references uh, to uh, one, uh, getting some assistance or uh, information, if you will, guidance from the Odessa Chamber with regard to helping small businesses in two ways. One, I think you said, potentially with uh, a business obtaining a loan, business loan. The other, which I think is even more important, uh, uh, maybe positioning them for a grant application to expand their business, create you know, create capital investment, uh, create jobs and whatnot. I think those are really important. Uh, and I, I think the other was partnering with the the, the uh, Black Chamber because we're expecting. And again, I don't want to speak for the board, but in our conversations we've had, we're expecting uh, you both both entities to uh, assist our, our existing businesses uh, because we think that they're, they're kind of getting lost in the shuffle. Mm. And so I'm, I'm really happy to hear of, of the intent and certainly look forward to seeing some uh, some good results out of that. So Absolutely. Yeah, I think we really want to make sure that we're, there's a, you, I think both chambers are uniquely positioned to reach parts of the community that may feel uncomfortable um, in other aspects of it. So we really want to make sure we're focusing on that and trying to get people to a you know, much better economic place. So. Any other questions, comments? Thank you. Okay. Move on to the next one.
Thank you. Good afternoon, and congratulations to the new board members. Um, we have the report, um, but I wanted to go over a few highlights uh, for the month of February. As I'm sure everybody recalls, us, like many others, were basically shut down for a week uh, because of the weather. Um, in spite of that, we ended up with 326 counseling sessions for the month of February. That's a 52% increase over February 2020. So I think that we're still trending very solid uh, in terms of uh, activity with clients. Um, we had four seminars presented. We had a total of 84 attendees. Um, I'll skip real quick to uh, some information about our partnerships. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, we have a partnership with the Hispanic Chamber. Uh, we've already done uh, two seminars uh, with them as a sponsor. The first one, is, as we were told earlier, had 59 attendees. The second one, which was People Fund, which is a little more uh, focused, uh, we ended up with 30. The last time we did a People Fund uh, webinar, we had about 13. So I would say the early results are pretty strong. Um, we also have now a partnership with the Black Chamber. Uh, their first uh, sponsored uh, webinar will be April 7th, and that's going to be how to start a business. And we're expecting good results from that as well in terms of number of attendees. That's going to have a broader audience in terms of people who would be interested. Um, another workshop we're having actually next week uh, is with uh, uh, Capital CDC. Um, they specialize, they do a lot of things, but one of their specialties is the 504 loan program. Um, and we've got several people signed up for that. Again, it's more of a directed type thing, but for people who are interested in expanding uh, in terms of real estate or equipment, it can be a very valuable session for them. Lots of good information. So we're expecting, right now we've got about 20 people signed up for that. Uh, and I think in the next week or so we'll have even more. So that's good. Um, for the month, nine businesses, nine businesses that are clients opened uh, in the Permian Basin. Two of those are in Odessa. Among those were things like a logistics company, an interior design studio, a yoga studio, uh, and then several of the others that are more common trucking companies, oil chain shops, things like that that we normally work with. Um, our clients for the month did a little over 1.25 million in capitalization. Uh, about 257,000 of that is from Odessa. Year to date, we're at about 12 million in terms of capitalization, with about 3.5 million of that in Odessa firms. About 40% of that, quite frankly, is related to either PPP or IDLE. Uh, we're up to now, we've got about 750 clients who have applied and or received uh, either PPP, IDLE, IDLE grants, some combination of the three throughout the Permian Basin. Any questions? Is your, your counseling suggestions, were those all uh, not in person, those all? Yeah, they were, th those were all, we're still, uh, because of university rules, we we're still having to do everything uh, on Zoom, quite frankly, or the phone. Most of them have, we started out, you know, back a year ago, probably 80% of them were on the phone, and 20% were on Zoom, now it's just flipped. How are your workshops working with, with that? Actually, really well. Um, that's one of the surprising things. Doing them through Zoom has given people the opportunity to attend without having to drive themselves to, you know, the airport, basically. Um, so we're getting a really good attendance. Um, you know, last month we averaged a little more than 20 people per, per webinar. That's kind of my magic number. Uh, not for any reason other than it sounds good. Um, there's no science behind it at all. But um, anyway, um, you know, I, that's kind of been my goal is to hit 20. And that's where we are right now. Thanks, for, quite frankly, to our partnerships with the Hispanic Chamber, uh, the Black Chamber, and some of our service providers such as People Fund, Capital CDC, things like that. I've got a comment on that. It's, it's yes, the first time that I've been on the board in four or five years, and then it's the first time I've seen the, the chamber, the chambers working together with you, and the results are obviously uh, positive. And it's nice to see that, that uh, yeah. when we work together, we can accomplish a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, it's, it's, a lot of that's coming from you helping them, and well, that's also helping with the two other chambers. Well, thank you. But that, 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 you know, it, it, obviously it's a relationship, and, and they're they're great people. So uh, I think they they more than contributed to what we're trying to do, and done a good job with it. 
Any other questions? Any others? Thank you. Motrain, Mr. James. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the new members, again, congratulations, welcome. Uh, over, I think, last month at your Zoom meeting, we gave an overview of the leveraging program, then we've had our, I guess, quasi-ODC Transportation Committee, before Chris Cole couldn't even get a hot sandwich. Uh, but, but we covered a lot of ground in that meeting, and we'll catch up with, uh, with the new members later on just to keep things moving along. But, uh, of course, the leveraging program we feel is a pretty good success. There's a big write-up in, in this month's report from us on that. Uh, but what I kind of wanted to do, one of the, the pages there in front of you is a little sheet about the Yukon Corridor Project. And I wanted to take the opportunity to kind of talk to you a little bit about why we do this and why it's important. You have one of those leverage projects that's part of that funding that was set aside for TxDOT that has been executed is for an overpass at Yukon in Loop 338. And you'll remember they put in a stoplight first, uh, but now are working on the, the overall interchange and getting that grade separated and make it safer and also build out Loop 338 in Odessa to a, a freeway design standard to make it a, a thoroughfare for economic development, residential development, all those sorts of things. But part of where that comes in important in leverage isn't just the additional tech stock funds and bumping that up, but the other things that happen along that. And one of the things that we detail in that on that second page is five projects that are occurring there. One is your interchange or overpass at Yukon and Loop 338. Uh, there is also a new interchange that will be going in at Highway 191 for Yukon. Uh, there is an extension of Yukon South from that new interchange. Uh, that will let this summer that Midland County is building uh, to take that all the way out to mesh in with Loop 40 at 1788 going up right up to the airport. And then you have a private developer who is paying to connect existing Yukon uh, down to 191 there at that point as well. So out of the whole thing you have one piece of it which is that overpass. But that overpass began another overpass that is leading to other developers and finishing that out. So it's, it's a much more comprehensive issue and that's what we really need to get to. Now the reason that we did this up wasn't to sell you on leveraging, it's because we're in turn taking this report back to TechStop when we're meeting with them next week to talk about the West Yukon Loop 338 overpass and talk about all the things that are happening here and how their state dollars are getting better leveraged. And by the way, instead of signalizing that one over there, can we go ahead and make that an overpass too? And at that point, we'll have Loop 338 from uh, 385 there on the north side all the way down to 302 will be grade separated interchanges on the west side, which we think will be important as well. So again, trying to get to those sorts of developments and again, bring in more money. And part of where that's also important is we're in the process over the last couple of years of 600 million in additional funding for the Permian and the UTP was predicated in large part because of all the leveraging we've been doing on the ODC side as well as the MDC side. And right now we're in the process of going into that UTP revision, which will be August of this year, and trying to extend that funding yet again from the state side because we've used up that first 600 million. So that's a little bit about what's going on there. The other thing that I would add in is a little broadband update that we've been working on some of that for you this year. and. Uh, We've got a, a larger package that we've communicated to Wes, but I wanted to give this to you. NetOps is a company here in our area that is a recent recipient of RDOF grant, and that has some of the maps of the areas that they're going to be covering with up to one gigabyte speeds as part of that grant, uh, as well as VoIP uh, abilities. And part of the reason that's important, I think a little bit later this week, the ECISD is going to be coming out with their updated survey that they did. And this is going to cover all but one of the areas that they're showing issues with in there. Uh, the bad side for this is the RDOF grant was only $69,000. So when you look at what they're covering, $69,000 really isn't ideal. But a lot of those larger companies have bid these up and that's caused a lot of problems. So 
it's over about a 10 year period that they'll be implementing this. Probably 95% of it will be in the first six years. And that's going to be the, the thing is trying to expedite that and move that forward in a faster way. But I know broadband is an important part of critical infrastructure today, so we want to share that with you. And again, Wesley's got more information on that and can kind of go from there. But that's our quick report for you today. Unless anybody has any questions. Uh, from uh -oh. our quasi-transportation committee, um, I guess I, I got three issues, James. I think we want to make the point that what we talked about uh, when we talked about instead of doing that signal, uh, going ahead and trying to do the overpass because I think you said it's a, you know we spend twice the money we get the overpass instead of spending half a million uh, we we'll spend a million dollars and then what we end up doing is uh, make steps towards creating a true loop as opposed to an intermittent loop is, is what I would think we have. So I think that's something that's worth noting is that maybe it's better rather than spend that half a million dollars, go ahead and spend a million dollars. We Now we get an overpass, I think it's, it's better value for the money. Uh, the other thing is we've got three and a half million dollars out of that $15 million that was committed that's, I think the term is unassigned, that we ought to be thinking about uh, are there projects that we want to go ahead and assign so that maybe it has the effect of moving those up on the schedule and whatnot? And so along with Motran, trying to identify what those projects are, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, and the other thing is being open to, are there other projects over and above the $15 million that we've committed? The reason I bring these points up is because I think the most one of the most powerful things that you provided is it, in the most conservative way, if you evaluate the return on investment for every dollar we've spent, uh, we're, we're getting twelve dollars back. You know that's a heck of a return on investment, and I think we just ought to be open to uh, the fact we know that all the infrastructure that we build in. It, it, it just pays the way for uh, growth, economic development as we know it. So, just wanted to make those comments. If you have anything that we talked about, Chris, that you want to add? I do. I think that actually covers it all. I think that, you know, one of my biggest questions to James was, you know, how do we figure out what's next? And we need to be talking about what's next in a very, not, not a short term, but a very long term perspective, right? You know, we had a long discussion about 338. And I'm not going to get into my feelings about 338, but um, I don't define 338 that, not just 338. We don't truly define that as a group, you know, and, and I think that had there been more thought about long term and what needs to happen and so forth, um, we could have taken a lot more traffic off the inside of the dust. So um, I'll just encourage us to always be open minded and, and be willing to. Um, think about other projects that they may come and we're going to look to you. I think it's where we should be looking to you to help us navigate that. You bet. It, as a note, UConn, the West UConn interchange, is not one of the, the projects that was on the authorized list in that 11.5 of the, the 15 million. Uh, and, and at some point we may come back to you to talk about that and see if that's an opportunity depending on what we hear back from you and the council. But what we want to do on that one first is talk to TxDOT about it because they're getting a really good return on their investment with this Yukon corridor. So I, I think this may be an opportunity where we can get them to step up to the plate. And that's always good. Other people's money, you know how that goes. So, uh, and, and it's your money, it's your gas taxes. So, uh, but depending on how that goes, we may come back to you on that. And I think there will be some other opportunities. I know right now we had a discussion with Hector County and the city of Midland on utilization of some of the CARES fund that's coming down the pike now on some other uh, cooperative ventures. So again, the more we can do to leverage it, move it forward, and advance it faster, the better. We'll be glad to do that. Yeah, the only other comment I'll make is the new board members haven't had a chance to sit down and have one-on-one -on -one with them. I would highly encourage you to do so. Um, because I, I, for me, I, I haven't had that opportunity. And once I had the opportunity, it really um, opened my eyes to a lot of things and made me understand exactly what the commitments were for 
and how we can leverage that going, going um, into the future. I do have one recommendation, though. If you order lunch, do not give it to Wesley. <laughs> Just <laughs> give your lunch order directly to us. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Yes. I, I passed out what the original 11 and a half million was. I think at one of the previous board meetings, y'all had asked uh, what that was. And it shows on what we've spent to date and this balance left over ties into the financial statement. But uh, since James was specifically talking about that, I wanted to go ahead and hand that out to y'all in case you had any specific questions. About Absolutely. Cindy, you're next. I'm next. And I apologize earlier, I should have introduced myself. I don't know if everyone, uh, the new members know me. I'm Cindy Muncy, I'm Assistant City Manager here at the city. And uh, I would also like to introduce Larry Fry. He is our finance director. He came to us in September, late August, September, uh, getting his feet wet into uh, how the city and ODC operates. He does the majority of your Odessa uh, development financial report each month. So I wanted, and we may start changing him out to talk to y'all instead of me. That might be a good first look for y'all. <laughs> Cindy, is it okay if we ask a question? Sure. And I'll, I'll sort of apologize. That's okay. It goes back to the audit. During the audit, I thought I heard you say something about business challenge expenditure. Yes. Did we actually have a business challenge expenditure in 2020? We had one in the 1920 year. Yes, we did. And so the way that that works is we actually sign that contract with the for the business challenge with SBDC, UTPB SBDC. So the auditors look at that as a contract signed. And so uh, if you'll recall during the year, you've seen this $150,000 sitting in liabilities on the financial statements. That's actually a business challenge grant that was awarded in 1819 that has not paid out yet, okay? So we recorded that expenditure in the year it was awarded, but it has not paid out yet. We also had some from the 1920 year that have not paid out yet. Now we paid, oh, I think we paid like 130,000 this year so far, so that number has gone down. The, in, the, in this current fiscal year, but at the end of the 930-20 year, there was quite a bit that was still not paid out yet. Okay. And Mr. Boutin, I thought you would comment on us being under budget on the... <laughs> so the way um, we do monthly financials is typically on a cash modified cash basis. That's what governmental entities do. Um, so one thing that you'll notice different in our monthly financial statement versus the audit is we do not accrue sales tax receivable. Sales tax, the month that it's for, runs about two months behind getting to us, okay? So at the end of the year in the audit process, we have to record that 60 days. So the accrual at the end of September of 19 was much higher than the accrual at the end of September of 20, and we all know why. So that reversal of that accrual put us under budget. So I just wanted you to, we were watching that pretty closely all year. And we may have a problem this year too. Sales tax has not been wonderful this year. It's coming back. It's coming back. We've got to be objective. So uh, in your package, you should have had the January financials. I'll go through this pretty quickly. I know y'all got more to do and get out of here. Um, our total assets, again, are at $58 million. Accounts payable is at $2,196,000. Again, I don't believe the um, we've paid out everything that was accrued in the audit yet. So this, these financials now have all the audit adjustment that we made for the audit in the year. So that's showing. So then uh, we have our short-term uh, payments out on our um, business incentive grants and training grants of 2.5. We have our long-term amounts at 14.882. So that's a total of 17409 Again, your text dot, 9.1 million. 
uh, our housing infrastructure and we're sitting at 4.9. Unreserved is sitting at 24.3. On the next page, we look at revenues and expenditures. Um, our uh, sales tax is at 3.1. This is through January. Our February number was very good. We were considerably over budget and pretty much over last year's amount, but that's because we had some audit collections during that the check that we received. In March, it was back down to 694000 That was under budget and under last year, so we're watching that. It's, it's looking a little dim. To date, we're at 25% under the prior year's amount, but we're 10 per, 10, almost 11% above budget to date. Okay. Uh, you'll see uh, expenditures in our audit services, uh, insurance, bank fees, the administrative fee with the city, your different contractors, the Chamber Motran Small Business Development Center, our marketing expenses, and then business incentives. And I believe that $10,000 was, uh, was a little amount turned in on a housing infrastructure. On the following page, you'll see the changes in our reserve fund balance. So these amounts showed up because they weren't on last month's reports, but these are actually amounts that were accrued into the audit, so we've made those changes. Okay. Um, down below, you will see the long term. Uh, some of these do not have a short term portion because they haven't actually met their investment requirements and started uh, being eligible for payments yet, so that will uh, come. I think we do have some of these that may fall off. I think Wes mentioned that to you earlier. The next page is just a change in the investment summary. This is a, a report we're required to provide under the Public Funds Investment Act. And then the following pages show you the portfolio for the beginning of the month and the portfolio for the end of the month. Um, we are trying to uh, find some investments that meet our qualifications to move some of our money out of the money market account. The interest rates are not looking very good. Uh, you can go out farther term and get better interest rates, but that's a little risky. So um, we are trying to find something. We're just working on that. Uh, and I will be glad to answer any questions you might have. How much of a how much of a restriction uh, in, uh, in in our investments? It, let's let's just talk about um, CDs, money markets. How much of a restriction is it the requirement for the the institution to provide securities to, to back that up? Is that is that pretty challenging with? It, it can be uh, because they have to be collateralized. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes that's a difficulty that we run into. Um, I think currently we've got some with uh, go back. we've got some with our depository contract, uh, BBVA, AIM Bank uh, is pretty good about being able to collateralize that. Um, of course, anything we do with Frost Money Market is totally collateralized, and then your pools are um, pretty much just, and your pools are um, highly liquid. You can move that money in and out daily. So uh, that's one of the reasons uh, governmental entities use those a lot, is because the liquidity is instantaneous almost. So. Some of those CDs are in the CDs programs. Uh, no, we don't. You know, we've been in the Cedars program in the past, and, and that's something that we may look into again. Um, they quit being real popular, uh, and, and with you know the government using them, that that's something we may look at and see if we can get some better interest rates there. Because in, in a Cedars program, they can um, we can buy into that, and all the collateral is held at the individual banks and we're just buying as a group, so we don't have to go get collateral at each one of those banks. So that is an option for us to try. So We, we used to do it. We had quite a few uh, in ODC in the past and in the city. The Public Funds Act does require them to pledge securities at 110% or so? 
it's at a hundred and yeah, I think it's a hundred and ten, yes. The Cedars program is our is our member um, there's a chance that you might take advantage of C D rates in other parts of the country that right. we're not experiencing locally that could right. be better. Could be better. It could be worse too. So. Right. Um, you know, uh, if you look at the the Fed's uh, anticipation of what they're going to do, they're keeping the rates pretty low. So I think they were projecting that out for the next two years still. So do we have the opportunity to uh, bring in other broker dealers or other firms that can help us with our investments? We can. I mean, it cost us money to do that, and I'm. You know, that's a direction that the city would like to go. Um, along with our investment policy that's adopted on an annual basis, we have to adopt our approved broker-dealers uh, that we utilize now. We can look at uh, doing a consulting type agreement to get some help with uh, investing ideas if that's Basically, the city adopts a policy and ODC follows along with it as, uh, you know, just to ease because we're doing all the transactions and stuff for the ODC. How many approved broker dealers do we have at this point? I think we have four. And um, right now, are all of the ODC funds commingled with the rest of the city funds and the investment pools? Or are they separate accounts? No, they're separate accounts. They're all separate accounts. We do, um, so uh, we do pay out bills out of our lump sum, our pooled bank account, and then we reimburse the city for ODC's expenditures through their through ODC's tax pool account. Okay, so as we're because all of our accounts payable that we pay on a weekly basis for the city and ODC go through the city's one pulled bank account uh, for ease and being able to do that. And then uh, we have ODC reimburses out of their text pulling. Yeah, Anything? Right. Okay. Sometimes I'd love to sit down with you and Larry and just get a, I've got a copy of the investment policy statement and I'd like to understand it a little bit better as far as what our restrictions are, what our capabilities are. Right, okay. That'd be possible, thank you. Okay. Okay, moving along, go to the committee and officer reports. Uh, partnership, Wesley, is that one that's about to start meeting again? You should be up to, yes. Okay, so we need to sign that. <clears throat> Tax incentive, we haven't had anything meeting. Uh, they'll, be, they'll be meeting in March, sometime March. within the next couple of weeks. Okay. They, they're supposed to meet in March of every year to uh, verify the tax abatement agreements and to approve tax abatement policies every two years to make recommendations on changes or anything. So that, that'll be happening soon, but we're good with that. And then advertising was Gene and I, and I think after the, the changes are made, we haven't met, but Craig, we'll get with him. That's the first, first opportunity. Later, you are. Later on, we're going to change these, these committees better, so we'll think that up a little bit. Okay, next is West, with, uh, West Texas Food Bank. Libby, there she is. So Libby Campbell here, uh, the executive director of West Texas Food Bank. She's here to answer any questions you might have. But uh, you might recall as we uh, went into uh, March, April last year, pandemic uh, issues began to really surface in our community and it had a direct impact on the food bank and the amount of volume that they were asked to uh, start accommodating and make making uh, more food available. and in order to make more food available for our community and our citizens in our area, there was no capacity for storage of uh, income, uh, incoming uh, perishable items. So, uh, the produce. produce, perishable items, okay, sorry. Um, the, uh, so, uh, we were approached and we went through this process and was very successful, as you know, to uh, help them with an expansion of a freezer cooler capacity in their facility. Uh, the board did approve that. It was COVID related. We, we were able to make that uh, expansion to an existing uh, warehouse and distribution center. At this point, the uh, cost for that expansion of their freezer cooler capacity has come in uh, about $269,583.42 under 
what was approved for that expenditure. They are here today and have written a letter in your packet to request the use of those previously allocated funds for a project at the food bank in order to accommodate some other needs that are addressed in that letter. Uh, forklift, uh, a, a smaller tractor trailer capacity uh, that, that would give them a different uh, and more expanded ability to get food from further out and ultimately save costs. They are here to answer any questions you might have on that. Uh, this, I don't know if this is an amendment to the agreement, but it's specifically the same funds just being reallocated for the same project with a different use. So I think I've tried to mess that up as much as I could, so I'm going to let uh, Libby talk at this point. Wes, and I apologize, that's one question I have from a legal standpoint. Is there anything that would prevent us I'm going to call on Tina. She's very shy, but um, Tina's looked at the contract and she has some ideas on some things. That's Christina. She's in our office and she does handle primarily the ODC. I was going to do this at a later date, but um, I think this is fine. Tina, can you let us know what you found when you look at that? Essentially, from what I found, it would be okay. We wouldn't have to change the terms of the contract. We could just include the, the vehicle in how it was written was for a freezer cooler expansion. So we could just maybe do an amendment or an addendum to the contract just to include those particular items because it is all essentially the same project that, that was approved and it's no additional funds. That's what I found. Thank you, Tina. And can legal make that amendment for us? Get that taken care of? Of course. Okay. If the board decides to. Yes. We'll have to vote on that. And that would still fit under the guidelines as far as what projects the OGC can address. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Distribution center expansions where, where this falls under. And maybe I commend you for using those funds so dil dil diligently that you had. You must not know very well. Well, I, I was shocked when I got that when they said they came under you so everyone goes over. Well, you did good and, and if we can help do this because I know y'all were very key in this community with the food bank with oil we went through in the last year. And we're still seeing long yes. lines. We are thankful that we are starting to see a decrease. We actually topped out in December at our highest monthly poundage which was 1.4 million pounds which was distributed to the 19 counties that we serve. Um, we have now come down to about 920,000 pounds of last month, so we're all very excited to see some of the lines are getting shorter. I think one thing that is still disturbing is we are actually now starting to see that our clients are starting to move out of our lines, but we're actually just starting to replace them still with new clients. So we, we were averaging about 32% of the people we were seeing between us and our partner agency that were new who had never needed any form of public assistance before. So that's if you think about SNAP, which is food stamps, unemployment, WIC, they had never needed assistance. Um, right now we're dealing with a legislative issue that's we're trying to reduce um, a SNAP qualification that has to do with auto, automobile. Um, the amount your automobile is worth actually goes against your, your number that you can qualify for SNAP benefits right now. Um, so many people in the state of Texas are actually unemployed due to kind of really the oil and gas industry. Most of them have vehicles that are over $10,000 and if they're married, their spouse has a vehicle that's over $3,000, which goes against your eligibility requirement to apply for SNAP benefits. What it's that doing is it's meaning that they can't go get actual help from SNAP. It's forcing them to still stay in the lines at the food bank. So that's an example of something we've been dealing with actually this past week um, on the state floor. So that's always exciting. Um, but we have done, actually, I just wanted to give you guys this number because without your assistance, we wouldn't have been able to do it. Since last March, we've done 3.5 million, almost 3.6 million pounds of produce. In comparison, the year before, we did 1.5 million pounds. There is no way that we could have done what we've been doing to fill that hole because the other problem is there's a supply chain issue still with food. So there's an aluminum, there's actually an aluminum shortage for like cans in the country to actually make canned goods. Um, and it's causing USDA an issue with being able to get us commodities out of the CARES Act and then the last stimulus bill because it's canned goods and it's a small amount of commodities that they're able to shop on their catalog. One way that USDA and Texas Department of Agriculture has helped fill that hole is through produce because there's been so much produce on the market. We are one of the few banks 
one of the few food banks in the state of Texas that has been able to depend on ODC and people like that to help us build freezer cooler space for us to take full advantage of what's been out there on the market. As I say that, that's about to stop. Farmers to Family Boxes actually de stops at the end of this month, which means we are going to be forced to procure produce to fill this hole until we start seeing a bigger decrease. And of course, us being able to use these funds to do the truck and the forklift and that kind of stuff in the trailer will actually reduce our monthly expenses that we have because we've been renting that right now with the lease agreement. We can actually put that more into and put that into purchasing more produce on the market to bring that in to fill the hole for the USDA. Any other questions? Yeah, I've got a couple of them. It's just maybe just a matter of semantics, but in your letter, I mean, we're talking about the fact that the project came in under 288000 plus. But then it says final expenses for cooler freezer, $16,000. There's, there's a discrepancy in the, the, the amount that Libby believed they had left over and, and when the city did their auditing of the actual expenditures. That's the difference in the in the two numbers, if that's what you're asking, from the letter request and what's on the agenda? Yeah. Or is there a different number there? We had an invoice, I think, that came in late okay. to us that we then submitted to the city, so it dropped it. But we had already written the letter. So what's, what's, what's on the agenda as far as the, the number on the, the rest? Uh, two, 269, 583, oh, okay. 42. Okay. And the letter was 288. Okay. Okay. Got it. Second thing is, I think I'm hearing you say, I mean, when we were, this was originally approved, it was to provide capacity, and, 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 and ODC's involvement came from the support of the local, primarily labor force, from our perspective. Now, you help a lot of other folks, but primarily the labor force uh, because of the uh, pandemic. Uh, and, and this is providing you more efficient way to, do, to continue the same capacity? We've is that actually, way to say it? sort of, we've had to, fi we've had to hire an additional CDL driver on top of what was already in the contract. So it is continued to add a support and we are having to continue at this point to probably add an additional warehouse and processor to continue because now the food isn't coming in boxes that it was from the United States government. Now we're going to have to go procure it, drive a truck to get it. So it's a little bit of a domino effect is what you're saying. Yes. It's an economic multiplier effect kind of in a weird way. We continue to add jobs at the West Texas Food Bank. We're well over 50 employees at this point. When I started 10 years ago, we had 24 people on staff. So we continue to provide jobs, and also not just that, if you look at the economic multiplier effect, that we give the ability for people to make the decision between putting gas in their cars to go to work or buy food for their children. Okay. Any other comments, questions? I'll need a motion. I'll make a motion to uh, make an amendment to the uh, Contract. A second? second. I'll second. A motion and a second. Any other discussion? Just one comment. I think I think if we if you agree with the original uh, grant request uh, and approving that grant request, this matches up with it. Uh, and, and that's a reason that I would support it. Okay. All right. All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign, and it passes. Norma, would you please note that I'm abstaining from the vote on this matter since I serve on the West Texas Food Bank Board? Yes, ma'am. Did you get that, Norma? Yes, sir, I did. All right. <laughs> okay, number 10, reappoint compliance committee members whose current time has expired. Those to Virginia, Reese, Jefferson Cox, Mike Whitrow, Gavin Norris, and Phil Padilla. I think that Phil Padilla has since, is, there, is that correct, Wes? He can make contact and be able to, be able to serve. So that leaves a vacancy open. Does anyone have talked to anyone or has anyone in mind? Mr. Chairman? Yeah. Could I ask, uh, just for us new guys, I don't know if Jeff or Larry would agree, um, can we table this to the next meeting? Would I like to just have a chance to review those guys? We may have some new names that we'd also like to bring to the table for the Lots Committee. Is that a possibility? <coughs> Perhaps if I uh, accept these being a form of motion. I can make a motion to the table. Can I? Okay. Wes, 
you need to get um, to work on a, on a project real quickly. Does this mess up the quorum in any way in respect to that? I don't think it would mess up the quorum. No, they'll, they will continue to serve until uh, there is our new appointment. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So we've got a motion to table this. We got a second. I'll second. Okay. Got a motion and a second. All in favor of tabling the motion, signify, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Same sign. Motion passes. So we're going to table this. Let's table the whole thing. I just said this. Okay. Um, Tim, uh, I, I would also ask that we provide particularly our new members mm -hmm. some background on those who are up for reappointment so okay. that they understand how long they've been there what you know what instrument is you know, where, yeah. where their expertise is and all those kinds of things so okay. that they, they can have some comfort level right. that list is included in the back of the packet as far as the terms and yeah. how long they've been on there but yeah it's the the expertise I think. exactly yeah. uh move to item number 11 discuss opponents for the committees. The committees of partnership advertising the downtown grants and what's the DFW's of design. I think on the last page of our bill that shows what, who was on the partnership. Partnership is the meeting of all the entities that come together and we've had to be real careful we only had five members because you couldn't have three serve because it your quorum problems, but now that we have seven, uh, and I would like to, it, it, to ask the board or the board what their preference is, giving, giving you some descriptions, the new members, some, some descriptions of what those entail so we can come back at the next meeting and assign those. Just for historical background on the partnership committee, it was a committee that was established 20 years ago or something, and it, it's typically been and set forth to be the chair of each entity and their stat, uh, chief, chief operating or executive officer of each entity. So the county judge and somebody and uh, city manager and mayor, those kinds of things. So just, just so you know what that arrangement on that committee typically is. But I can pick, of on, each entity. I can pick on someone and make them serve with me. That it's, you can, yes sir. <laughs> Point of clarification. And it's always good to have a backup if you can't make the meeting, et cetera, those kinds of things. Wes, you don't see any reason if we did, we wait until next meeting to do that give them a chance to see which ones they might want to serve on we might be able to serve i'd like to serve get the committee members that want to serve on that committee versus being told to serve that. you have two committees that you'll have to replace one because gene is no longer on there uh melanie and daniel uh david Daniel, sorry david uh david will serve until replaced uh, right. we will be having a meeting of the tax incentive committee before our next board meeting and they only meet once a year so okay. I'm not sure it does any good to change that unless you change it today. Well, and we, and Melanie and Daniel have done great. Things. Exactly. <laughs> Especially Daniel. Especially Daniel. Okay, last item. Do we have any citizens that have any comments? Uh, seeing none, I would like a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion. And a second? Second. Got a motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. We are standing adjourned at 2.22.